All right. Thanks, Patreon supporters, for joining us for a very special. This is the first ever, but hopefully, you know, if it goes well, we'll do more of these. Uh, spoiler interview with Zoya Stage, uh, where we talk about some, we dig into some specifics about the book Wonderland. I want to just say, if you have not read the book, um, this will spoil everything, um, or at least spoil very, very significant parts of it. Um, so just be careful. If you if you decide to listen to this, I hope you already read it, or you just don't care about having the total plot spoiled for you. All right. So thanks, first of all, for taking a little bit of extra time to answer some like nitty gritty spoiler questions. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. All right. So killing Shaw seemed like a bold move, like halfway into the book. Was that was it always the plan to kill him off? Um, I'm trying to remember that far back. I mean, it was always it was in the first draft. There were many drafts of the book and it was in the first draft. In the way I write, I don't plan things very far ahead. Um, so it's like I knew certain things that were going to happen at the end. I'm trying to remember. I mean, I obviously had no compunctions about killing him off. Um, I can't remember if it was a plan, though. <laughs> but now when I think about it, it's like, oh, I really wasn't envisioning Orla at the end of the book with her husband. So maybe I did plan that. It's just it's it's interesting. Like there are things that just catch you off guard. And and I think in the structure of a book where it's a family of four out in the middle of nowhere, you kind of almost expect all of them to make it to the end. Yeah. And if they don't like, you know, so as I'm reading it, if you said, hey, if Shaw bites it, when do you think it's going to be? I'm like, oh, in the climax, like he's going to sacrifice himself to save his family or something along those lines. Not smack dab in the middle of the book, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> That was that was a great way to 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 throw the reader a curveball, like right in the middle of the story. Well, thank you. So, kind of speaking of that, I guess um, Livius and I both agreed, kind of in different ways, that there was a very kind of specific moment in the book where there was a shift from what we were talking about in the normal uh, interview, where we were talking about how all of this could realistically be something that we could explain away as real and not supernatural. But there was a moment where it shifted to like kind of a now, like acknowledging that like something supernatural and weird is, is happening to us. Um, so for me, like the, the experience, the way that the book felt natural, like, like significantly changed but I, I appreciate it. I think Livius did too. So um, was there any trouble making that transition or, or it seems like you, you don't like, like you were saying before, don't necessarily plan super much, but like there's a different feel from like the first part and the second part. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, in that sense, I don't plan a lot plot wise. I do always know something that's going to happen in the middle of the story and something mm -hmm. at the end. Um, but I knew that Orla had to – she had to go through this huge transition before she could really accept what was happening and that I had right. to have her go through all of those different stages um, because otherwise it just it, – to me, it wouldn't feel like a satisfying book if she got there too soon and if she believed it too soon. So, And also part of why even the events that get so intense – you know, here is this spirit being trying to communicate with her and the more resistant she is, you know, it does sort of accelerate and amplify the efforts on the beings part too. So, so those things kind of go hand in hand until yeah. Orla could reach this point where it's like, okay, I can't deny it anymore. This is completely beyond anything I ever understood that could be real, but it is real. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm not even sure how to phrase this next one, so I'm just going to kind of let it roll out of my head. Okay. We were pretty sure that the family was going to consider eating Shaw. <laughs> and I guess I want to know, are we right? Did you consider that? I had not considered that. I had not I'm just thinking, that. like, he's out there, and you mentioned that he's frozen and, like, probably perfectly <laughs> preserved, and Orla's, like, getting a rifle and going to go out hunting, and I'm like... She's got to walk past that body and be like, you know, it's just like throwing a steak in the freezer. Well, this was not an Almakatsu book. This is not yeah. the hunger. So. <laughs> that's 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 very true. But I did, and then at one, but at one point, and I I wish I had bookmarked it or something. 
there was even like a line or two in there. And I was like, oh, this is the indication. I was like, this is going to go so dark. So, so dark. I'm but, glad you thought that, though. Yep. It did not yep. occur to me. I mean, I I think that that would be a boundary that that <laughs> family could not go past. Or, or if they did, it would have to be so much worse than where they were. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad that you went there. That yeah, made it I extra mean, exciting for you. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's, yeah, I, I got to tell you, sometimes, you know, being in well, my head is an interesting place. And what does it say that me and Livius both each arrived there independently of each other? Like... We had a conversation where, like, you thought they were going to try and eat them, right? right. That's so. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a different book. If I had just gone for pure survival and, like, maybe hadn't really had a supernatural element, like, maybe really Orla was losing her mind, like, that could have happened in that book where Orla lost her mind. I could see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I'm forming this question as... as I'm talking, so it might sound a little bit awkward, but one of the things that I really enjoyed about the later part of the book was uh, once Orla more or less accepted that Eleanor Queen had a connection with this uh, this being, I, I thought it was cool that they would have these little breakout sessions where she would use her basically as like a consultant or a translator. Uh-huh. Um because for me, like in the book, like her being a little girl who the parents just aren't listening because they don't want to believe the crazy thing that's going on um, was paid off with the fact that like now she's the one who can help them find a solution to the problem. So right. um, I really appreciate I thought that was a great way to kind of elevate that relationship in a way where they were like, well, I guess we have to, you know, accept that, like the, you know, the tooth fairy is real and and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if they have to accept the tooth yeah. fairy is real, but maybe they should listen to their children. Like maybe they should. Yeah. <laughs> kids are aware, you know. Discuss this about Hannah and baby teeth too. That kids might not be able to name everything correctly because they don't know everything about the world, but they have a lot of awareness and a lot of intuition. And I feel like kids aren't given enough credit for that level. It's, and I do think for, for some children, it is a spiritual level. And um, and I think a lot of adults just write them off as being naive. But they know things. They do know mm-hmm. things. Yeah. All right. This, I mean, this whole thing is, is this whole spoiler question interview is just a guise for us to like get answers for things we, we weren't really sure about. So um, <laughs> this one is pretty. So it, you sent us um, copies um, that were signed, and thank you again. But they also had little snow globes drawn drawn in, and we received them in the winter time, which we just assumed was a nice winter time touch. But about two thirds of the way through the book, I flipped back and I looked at it, and I said, "I think this is a representation of the area they're living in because they're trapped and yep. it's snowing." So I guess I just wanted to validate: was I right about that? Or yes, do you, yes, were you, you do- were right. Beautiful. Right. So I. I was like, well, it's either that or it's just like winter doodles, one of the two. And I was kind of hoping that no, I was you were right. right. With okay. This, I've started this trend for myself. I don't know how I'm going to keep this going. But with baby teeth, I drew one of little Hannah's under slumber bumblebeasts in each book. Like that's how I signed it was with that wow. doodle. So I knew I had to come up with a little doodle for Wonderland, which is actually this one was a little harder to draw quickly. Um, and now that's going to be my thing. I'm like, I am not sure what I'm going to do with book three. In terms of a doodle, but but yeah, that's my thing now is to draw a little doodle that has something to do with the content of the book. It's a nice touch. Well, oh, thanks. Um, so the end, the very we're going to talk about the very ending, which this is exciting because we never do this. Well, I guess we never do it on the podcast, but um, uh, there when the lightning strikes the vehicle, like everything is beautiful, they're happy, like things seem to be kind of reaching an equilibrium, and Orla's even. Um, coming to terms with how she relates to or not relates to but like interacts with you know her daughter who has a spirit inside of her and everything seems very cool and everything but then when the lightning hits the car it introduces a concern basically because like yeah that could have just been something where you know her powers got out of control but it could also be a lingering need for that spirit to not move away um and so 
I, me and Livius are, are very different in the way that we, we like to interpret these types of things. I like to think that, um, it, it's that it's sowing that seed of like, oh no, things aren't all good and it's going to go bad. And I don't know if Livius felt the same way, but you probably have an idea of what that really meant. I do. Um, I mean, I, I like to sow that seed of doubt. And I think Baby Teeth has actually, in my mind, a very similar kind of ending where some people will think of Hannah as being evil forever. And other people will think of her as a child with mental illness and that she could get better. Mm -hmm. Um, And my my hope for Wonderland, I mean, I know some people are going to automatically jump to, oh, no, Eleanor Queen has this spirit in her and we have no idea what she's really going to do. But I want to keep open the possibility of like, well, maybe she would go to the polar ice caps and restore the ice. I mean, do we know that it's going to be horrible? We just don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things about the entity that's inside her that I don't have a definitive answer to in terms of, you know, what's Eleanor Queen going to be like when she's 20? I mean, I don't know. In that sense, like if I... If I ever wrote a sequel of one of the books I've already written, I would probably be more inclined to explore Wonderland because there are things I don't know about that entity and about who Eleanor Queen could become with that entity. But I I like to leave open this possibility that it could be interpreted in a positive way or a negative way, depending on where people's individual sensibilities go. I tend to like to think positively because that's who I am. But, you know, we live in a world, everything is this balance of good and bad and dark and light. Everything is a balance. So I like to have that present. Yeah, I think that I think you established that pretty effectively, too, with the way that it ended. Um, Because it was just that little stinger at the end of like a what if. So um, it did leave it open nicely. Um, And and, and you saying that actually makes me the the you saying that there's things you don't know about. Um, you know, those elements of the book made me think about how I, I appreciated that you introduced something that was supernatural and obviously very powerful, but didn't make it too big of a deal or too big of a part of the story. You basically tapped on what you needed to make it effective as as part of the plot without like over elaborating or, you know, right. going nuts with it. So, um, yeah, um it's kind of nice that there's those unanswered questions. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think in earlier drafts, it was a little bit maybe too unanswered. I had honestly been really (laughs) reluctant to have an honest to God origin story. I was a little reluctant to do that. I understand why it is more, more satisfying to have at least some definitive sense of what it is and what's happening. But I don't know. I liked I I find the spirit very interesting. I mean, because whatever she originally was once as a girl with tuberculosis, her hundred whatever years embodied in this tree and with these other spirits, she is something else now. I mean, she is something that hasn't really quite existed before. So, yeah, I couldn't possibly have all the answers about that. (laughs) Like defining what God is. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, that's all the questions we had, but since we've never done this before, I thought I'd give you the opportunity. Is there anything that you want to talk about that's spoilery with the book or we could just, uh, we could wrap it up too. Yeah, let me think if there's anything. Like a thing you're dying any- to say. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I think you asked, cause I would, I would, I would expect people to ask about, yeah, killing Shaw and certain of the supernatural things. So no, I I think you covered all of that. Awesome. Well, thanks for indulging us with this little extra bit of the interview. And um, we know it's, it's late on the East coast, so we're going to let you go, but thank you so much for your time. And um, like Olivia said before, can't wait for the next one. Thank you so much. I think this was a really good idea. Don't you? (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Yes. It went went very well. I'm very happy with this. So uh, yes, we will likely be doing more of these in the future. I'm um, not sure if we'll see one of these for the Josh Mallerman interview, but I get the feeling that this year will bring us a couple more um, spoiler uh, interviews and let us know. Let us know if you liked it. Let us know if there's something else we should ask. So 
Um, that's it. That's it for this episode, this spoiler interview, Patreon <laughs> exclusive episode. We don't even have a name for this thing yet. So, <laughs> hey, thanks again for all your support. And uh, you'll be hearing again from us real soon. <laughs>